practice of Roman Catholicism. Uh, Brother Paul, can you lead us in prayer before we get started this afternoon, sir? Lord, we all come here because we want to study the Word, we want to apply it correctly. We've been talking on some Sunday afternoons about like other, uh, other sects, uh, other areas that would call themselves prophetic that have some pretty serious error. Lord, I pray that you would reveal to us that we have any error in our lives. At this time, Lord, I would ask that you would give David the wisdom as he teaches on this subject today. And give us first to learn. And help us, Lord, to be able to understand. And, uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So last week we covered a uh, wide number of subjects, about uh, about five of those. We talked about uh, Catholicism, how they view uh, uh, the Bible and tradition in authority. Uh, we also talked about images and worship last week. Uh, we also talked about some, let me see, what else? I got a list right here. Yeah. We talked about... Uh, celibacy, uh, was Peter the first pope, uh, so we talked about some of those things, but today we're going to get into a biggie, and that is basically uh, the study of what we call Mary Mariolatry, I've got it wrong, it says Mariolatry, not Mariology, uh, but uh, it is basically the worship of Mary. Now, Catholicism will tell you that they do not worship Mary, but from the writings, they do worship Mary, I will tell you that right away. So the venerate, but it's tomato, tomato. <laughs> you know, it's uh, basically uh, just church. Yes, yes, yeah, they will. Yeah, that's part of their uh, penance or uh, for certain sins and things like that. They will tell you to do so many hail marys and count your rosary beads and and that kind of thing. But uh, anyway, so we're going to get into that Mariolatry. Uh, so what they teach is that Mary was born without original sin. Uh, that 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 she, what they refer to as the immaculate conception. The immaculate conception is not the virgin birth of Jesus. The immaculate conception uh, teaches that she was born without original sin and that she never sinned. Uh, is what they teach, which contradicts the scriptures. Uh, Romans 5 and 12, Therefore just as through one man entered the world, and with sin death, death, this coming to all men inasmuch as all sin. And then uh, from 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22, Death came through one man, all men die in Adam. Now the quotes that I'm going to read as far as Scripture are come from their own Bible, the, the Bibles that they use. Jerusalem Bible, Douay Bible, uh, New American. Uh, so... Even, they're all, even the Bible that they will say it's okay for Catholics, Catholics to use will uh, deny the doctrines that they teach concerning these things. So they teach that she never actually committed any sins, that she was sinlessly perfect. Uh, you know, but, of course, what John says, uh, 1 John 1 and 2, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and, and uh, the truth is not in us. Uh, so... It denies, the scriptures deny for anyone to say uh, that they have never committed sin, that they could be sinlessly perfect. But the Roman Catholic Church teaches that Mary never was born without original sin, as the scripture teaches, and never committed any sin. Uh, other scriptures that, of course, that deny this is there is not a good man left, no, not one, Romans 3, 9 through 10. Uh, and even Mary herself. In Luke 1, 46-47, Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit exalts in God my Savior. <laughs> so she obviously did not see herself as sinless. She saw that she needed a Savior, uh, Mary herself. Uh, they also teach that Mary... Uh, was a virgin perpetually, that is, that she never, she had the virgin birth of Christ and never had any other children. But, of course, the Scriptures themselves deny this. Uh, in Matthew 1 and 25, uh, speaks there, uh, when he wrote, Matthew wrote this, he knew her not, speaking of Joseph, he knew her not till she brought forth, forth her firstborn son. He didn't say her only son. 
her firstborn son. So if it's his firstborn son, that is presumptive that she had other sons and other children uh, also. And then the Bible specifically says that Jesus had brothers. Uh, again in Matthew, this time in chapter 13, 55 through 56. Isn't Mary known to be his mother? And James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, his brothers, aren't his sisters our neighbors? So obviously from the Scriptures, for them to say this is a denial of the Scriptures, what the Holy Scriptures teach. Uh, and again, all these joined, talking about uh, uh, in Acts 1 and 14, when all of the, the band, we talked about the 120 this morning, uh, part of that was Mary and some of her children. Because in Acts 1 and 14, it says, All these joined in continuous prayer together with several women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. We're not talking about brothers in Christ, but brothers, literal. Uh, and then they will claim that, uh, oh, here's, here's something else. And the Roman Catholics will claim that Matthew, Luke, and Paul uh, wrote of this, didn't mean brother when they said brother, but meant cousin, okay? But the problem with that is it has no basis in Scripture, and the word that they use in the, uh, for Greek, adelphos, is always translated brother and is never translated cousin. So the, he, Mary obviously had other children. She obviously was a sinner because she said herself that she was a sinner. Uh, but uh, she is venerated as a saint in the Catholic Church. And most of this came about, there was a man uh, by the name of Bishop Alphonse de Ligori. Uh, he lived from 1696 to 1787, and he wrote a book called The Glories of Mary. Not only uh, did they not declare what he had to say as heresy, but they venerated him as a patron saint, a patron saint of confessions, is this guy that wrote this book. And I was going to read you some of these statements in this book that the Catholic Church still holds to regarding the person of Mary. And so it says, She is truly a mediatress of peace between sinners and God. Sinners receive pardon by Mary alone. Mary is our life. Mary in obtaining this grace for sinners by her intercession thus restores them to life. He fails and is lost who has not recourse to Mary. Of course, what the Word of God says, there is one God and one mediator of God and men, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2 and 5. Jesus saith to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Okay? Then it says in much of their writings, Mary is more glorified than Christ. In this particular book, the Holy Church commands a worship peculiar to Mary. Many things are asked from God and are not granted. They are asked from Mary and are obtained. For she is even queen of hell and sovereign mistress of the devils. What they say. Uh, the Word of God says there is something very different. In the name of Jesus Christ, for there is no other name under heaven given to men whereby we must be saved. Uh, Acts 3 and 6 and 4 and 12. Uh, his name is above every name, not only in this world, but also in the world which is to come. Ephesians 1 and 21. Uh, another one, Mary is called the gate of heaven because no one can enter that blessed kingdom without passing through her. The way of salvation is open to none otherwise than through Mary. Since our salvation is in the hands of Mary, he who, who is protected by Mary will be saved. He who is not will be lost. Again, John 10 and 1, Jesus says, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. You know, and then Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other than in Jesus Christ. So again, another one. All power is given to thee in heaven and on earth so that at the command of Mary all obey, even God. And thus, God has placed the whole church under the dominion of Mary. Mary is also the advocate of the whole human race, for she can do what she wills with God. Hmm. Okay. And according to Matthew 28, 18, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow. Uh, Philippians 2, 9 through 11. 
So, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the just, and He is the propitiation of our sins, 1 John 2, 1 and 2. A uh, couple more. Mary is the peacemaker between sinners and God. We often more quickly obtain what we ask by calling on the name of Mary than by invoking that of Jesus. She is our salvation, our life, our hope, our counsel, our refuge, our help. Word of God says this, But now in Christ Jesus you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for He is our peace. So you see the high regard, The really it's an idolatry. It's an idolatry of Mary that the Roman Catholic Church has. They will tell you that they do not worship her, but they're, I think a lot of that is ignorance. I think a lot of their people don't know the doctrine concerning Mary. They've never read probably the glories of Mary written by this man uh, 250 years ago, basically, uh, over that. So I mean, we need to have compassion in these regards when we talk to Catholics and that here, you know, this, this is what your doctrine teaches. You may not think that it does, but this is what your own teachings say, and they supersede, they attempt to supersede God's Word. Uh, so, anyway, uh, this particular man uh, promoted Mariolatry more than any of the other body before or after him, uh, and so he's basically uh, been like I said, canonized as a saint. So anyway, this is where they are in regards to worship of Mary. They also call her the mother of God. Give her that title. Uh, you know, a name which is impossible and illogical because uh, God is eternal. Amen. Yeah, Jesus is eternal. He's the eternal son of God. Uh, you know, he said before Abraham was, I am in John 8 and 58. Uh, so the divine nature of Christ existed long before Mary ever existed. But this is, you see, you know, and I'm not trying to put down people that, that are just Catholics, but a lot of them don't really realize, I don't think, what the doctrine of their church teaches. Uh, but she is not, uh, obviously. This is almost akin, if you remember, to like Mormonism uh, that talked about, God and and uh, and Mary and having a child, Jesus. It's, it's very close akin to that. But a lot of this comes from paganism. They mixed in, if you understand Roman Catholicism, that a lot of their teachings when they would go into these countries, they would mix paganism with the Bible. And uh, so down through the years, you have this mixed bag junk theology uh, is what they have. But it, you know, and it, but it's not it's not an innocent theology. Uh, it is a very deadly theology. So, anyway, we need to we need, but we do need to understand what they teach. Uh, it is much different than uh, Christianity teaches. Any comments? Any questions about any of that? Didn't Constantine, when he decided to to make Christianity Catholicized Christianity uh, the official religion, he's uh, in all these pagan lands and, and had a lot of pushback. Well, if they want icons, give them icons. Yeah, yeah. If they want this, give them that. Yeah, yeah. There was, a, there was a sense that that's where a lot of that stuff that got away from Scripture started. Yeah. And the Mariolatry came along more so after that. Well, yeah. Some of that was there even then. But some of, that, some of the things, yes, was there even then. Well, if you go into their churches and in their cathedrals, she has a very, very elevated type of position. Uh, even above Christ, they will. They, they lift her up. I mean, it, it, it is pure idolatry is what it is, really. I think, I think the elevation of Mary actually started a lot earlier than that. Just look at uh, Luke 11, 27 and 28. Um, now, it happened while Jesus was saying these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that which she nursed. But he said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Yeah. So yeah. But that even started back that. That's a good, that's a good point. Trying to, trying to elevate her right now. Yeah. So it wasn't a far leap for them in their theology to I mean, push that. Christ himself corrected yeah. this woman there at that time. Sure. Well, I mean, I mean, and that type of idolatry has been 
throughout time. I mean, the Roman world, the Caesars were gods. And so it wasn't a far stretch for the mother of Jesus to have been lifted up in idolatry uh, after that. And that's continued for 2,000. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, and you look at all the goddesses there were in the Roman and the Greek culture. So, like we say, it wasn't very hard to mix Mary in with these other goddesses to venerate or to worship her. If you also look, though, in our, so if you were to go to our apostolic fathers, they have strong roots in Greek moralizing, oriental theorizing, and things like that, too. So it was a twofold thing, but if you notice from the death of Christ, immediately after until now, it was always adding something to the gospel. Mm-hmm. That was a big part of the, the Protestant split of the Reformation. Mm-hmm. Hey, this is the gospel. We're going to add this. Mm-hmm. You know? um, and I think if you look at the Council of Trent, you oh. spoke about it. You want to just get out of history and you want to talk about more of a modern time. If they, if they catechize your children or they're, they're, that, they're still holding to the things of the Council of Trent. Right. They're still right. saying that it's more than Christ. Yeah. It's always been Yeah, I mean, and they will try, even in this day and time, to say basically that they're more compassionate toward other religions and things like that. But the reality is, is they've never gone back from the Council of Trent. They've never reverted from any of that. They've never apologized for any of the persecution of Christians during the uh, Reformation and, and pa- or prior to that or, or since then. Uh, I mean, we, we struggle with the same thing even after the Protestant Reformation where people are trying to add, you know, or accept, you know, uh, repentance and faith, right? It's always one plus one equals faith, right? We, we try to say, well, one plus one plus one will do this and then do obedience and do these things. But really it's repentance, faith, and then production of those things. Sure. And, we're gonna, and I'm going to get into that. I don't know if I'll get into it today, but about their view of justification, what their ju- view of justification is basically, you know, well, it, it's not enough for him to just declare you justified. You have to add to that. I want to get into a little bit here now to the indulgences of the confessional. Uh, the confessional, let me see, where did I uh, lost it here. Uh, the, yeah, the confessional. So this was established basically under Pope Innocent III in 1215. Uh, that confessions of our sins are to be made to an authorized priest for the purpose of obtaining forgiveness. Uh, so that's, you know, and that's still going on in this day and time. That you go into a box, you confess your sins. Uh, I've seen it portrayed on television uh, where you go in and you say it's been so many days or so many weeks since my last confession. Uh, okay, so, you know. But the, the problem with this is, is this puts a, a man who is like you and me as a mediator between us and God. And of course, we, you know, these priests do not have the power to forgive sins. Only one has the power and the authority to forgive sins. Uh, we can pray for one another. I can forgive you for a transgression against me, but I can't forgive you before God for that. Um, you know, uh, I, the, so the scripture talks about us confessing our sins to for to one another and praying for one another, but confession was you know is it, not something that you go to a, a man in a box and then you confess to him and then somehow he carries that to God as if he has more access to God than you do. Uh, so, uh, so the the confessional is 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 unbiblical, uh, to, say, to say the least, uh, in that. Uh, when we look at the Scriptures, um, as, we, as we look at this, it says the Son of God, or the, excuse me, the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, is what Jesus said. So he was not a mere man. He, you know, Jesus forgave sins here on earth while he was here in his ministry, but demonstrated his deity at that particular point in time. But Fortunately for us, there is the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and so 1 John 2 and 5, that we go to him. 
Uh, of course, we have the picture in Hebrews, in many of the passages of Hebrews, uh, to the throne of grace and mercy, that he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, interceding for us according to the will of God. Uh, so confession of sins, I mean, yes, we're to do that, but we don't do it to a man. We do it to Christ. You know, uh, 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He being Jesus uh, there. So we don't go to a man, but... Um, the Roman Catholics teach that you have to go to a certain authorized priest to be able, they don't believe in that instant, uh, in fact, they don't believe in just, they wouldn't even say they believe even in just uh, Christ being the intercessor. They would also see, as we say, as we've already talked about Mary, that you can go to Mary or you can go to one of the saints uh, there. And maybe if they have some extra merit from their righteousness, they can give it to you. I mean, I'm getting ahead of myself here. But, uh, uh, you know, but when, when the publican and, the, you know, the publican and the Pharisee, if you remember that story, when the publican cried out for forgiveness, he didn't cry out to, he didn't try to find some rabbi. He said, God be merciful to me, the sinner. He recognized that there was only one who could forgive sins, and that was, that was God himself. So, uh, you know, this was, pretty, this was a pretty late innovation. This was not until, the, like I said, in 1215, uh, in the 13th century, that they began that. So this is a little farther down. You know, Paul talked about Constantine. Um, I, the, that slips my mind what year that was. That was 3rd century. 325. Okay. I, I thought it was 4th century, yeah. So this was way after. This was nine centuries later that they started this practice of confession to a priest there. Then we get to indulgences. One, one thing oh, oh. 300 AD, they made a bunch of changes to make people happy. In 1200 AD, they made a bunch of changes. Later, they added the Mariology. It's, been a, it's not been a constant. Oh, goodness, no. It, no. It's not based on the word alone. Right, right. Well, on the whole... Each pope, and you're probably not going to talk about this today, but the pope can make a decree. Oh, yeah. It's no longer wrong that. Thing. Yeah, whatever sin I say is not wrong anymore. Guess what? It's not wrong anymore. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I, I don't know that I'll talk about that today. That goes back to what my grandfather told my brother. That the, the, the Pope supersedes the Bible. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. He said what the Pope says trumps the Bible. Okay. So if, we, if he decides that something is not sin anymore, then... It's not sin anymore, at least in Catholic those, eyes. Those, yeah, those who are truly Roman Catholic. Yeah, okay. Because if they can't hold on to the, after the Reformation, they can't hold on to the meaning of the Scripture, they can hold on to the interpretation. I think they're doing right. They're making all these legalistic things right. You know, it's a, it's a money and power thing, too, the Catholic Church, unlike any other. They are a force. You know? well, well, money and power kind of takes me to the next thing, indulgences. Uh, that was one of the things that drove the Reformation was the abuse of indulgence. Now somebody might be sitting, what is an indulgence? <laughs> Do what? Uh, no. But an indulgence is the remission of punishment caused by sin, some way that you pay for that, that you get this sin remitted. Uh, and it was the abuse of basically payment, money, for indulgences prior to the Reformation. Now, there's indulgences for what they call mortal sins, and then there's the venial sins. A venial sin uh, being a slight sin. Mortal sin being something more like for murder, I would guess. <laughs> something along those lines. And so they would, they would re- have you remit a part of, of the temporal punishment due to sin and shorten the suffering due to the sinner on earth and in purgatory. Yes, we're going to get to purgatory. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about that some. But a plenary indulgence gives an entire remission of temporal punishment. Indulgences derive their efficacy in remitting the temporal punishment due to sin from the superabundant merits of Christ and His saints. So I mentioned that just a minute ago. That, they're, that the saints, they believe that some of the, the ones that they call saints have extra righteousness that can basically, for an indulgence, be siphoned off to you. <laughs> to where you can get more cleansing. You can get more forgiveness of sin. Uh, if you pay a certain amount of money, that was the abuse in the, the uh, time of the Reformation. Uh, and that, over time, is what riled Martin Luther up 
and uh, they would never back down from that. Uh, again, I'm still so amazed that he that he never was martyred, uh, that they couldn't catch up to him. Uh, but that was in so God's. He still, he still knows a couple of uh, well, he had some rich he had some rich friends that would hide him out too. <laughs> uh, God in His providence uh, did that. That's why we're not <laughs> but so they have these so these uh, saints have these extra merits that are stored up uh, for us less saintly Christians is what they say and so uh, this teaching of course is unbiblical there's two reasons why it's unbiblical the Bible teaches that even the best saint cannot gain, gain merit even for himself there's no extra merit uh, along the way we don't add to our justification that's the thing. I haven't gotten to justification yet. But anyway, I, I want to teach so bad on it. I'm like, Ugh. But anyway, uh, that they believe that you know that you add to that, uh, and so that somehow that you can you can do the indulgence and you can get some of this extra merit, and it gets you out of purgatory faster, or it helps pay off for your slight sin pa- faster, or with no punishment, or your your uh, mortal sin faster. Then you know. The second reason why this is wrong is for the believer, Christ has gained all the merit a Christian will ever need. (laughs) I mean, you know, uh, my justification and my merit is not my own. It is put on my account by Christ for everyone that's ever had faith in Him. His atoning death, you know, His payment with His own blood. He paid for the penalty of my sin. So there's nothing to be added to it. And if I sin, I can't take away from that. It's there permanently. It's a legal declaration. Uh, and I'm going to get ahead. Do what? Yeah. yeah, double imputation. There's no double imputation. Uh, David, too, I to say that we, since, the, since the death of Christ, we we're all trying to fight uh, for, like, to prove the fact that Christ's death was enough. Right, and a lot of the times, the Catholic Church, I'll say it all the times, all the time, they've been known as keeping him on the cross, right? Right. Keeping him crucified. Like it was right. Never ever enough that he had died for your sins, right? Right. Uh, that 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 really doesn't really mean anything anymore. Right. Um, if you're you're paying for all this stuff. Correct. But yeah, so yeah. Always were yeah. What does that mean? Thought of as keeping him on the cross. Yeah, and we haven't gotten to it yet. We won't get to it today, but the whole doctrine of transubstantiation, what the Lord's Supper means to the Catholic Church, about that the, the bread and the wine literally become the body and the blood of Christ. This, this we'll get, side, oh, sorry. Go ahead. This idea of indulgence is also compared to the charismatic frenzy. I mean, sow the seed. Oh, sowing the seed. And you'll get healing and you'll get prosperity. Like, that is a, mm-hmm. Okay. That is a, Twisted point. Well, kind, kind of an offshoot of that. Yeah, offshoot of that. Mm. And, and that's why so many, like for instance, my uncle got saved. We don't, we're not really sure he's speaking the lingo. <laughs> but he's in a charismatic church. And mm. most Roman Catholics, that when they transition into a Protestant movement, in a sense, as a world deems Protestant, anybody that's not Catholic, you deal with people who go straight into the charismatic churches. Mm. They don't come out of Catholicism into, most of the time, they don't come hmm. out of Catholicism into like the Protestant Reformed Church. They come out and get into the charismatic churches and then segue into Reformed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah now, the, I, the first I ever really saw uh, that I really dealt much with people that came out of Catholicism were saved was down in San Antonio. Most of those people that I knew of had been saved into good churches. Good. You know, that were, you know, that preached. To yeah. some extent, in Baltimore, the same. Baltimore is heavily Catholic and heavily Jewish. Yeah. It something more than 100%. Interesting. Down Baton Rouge is totally different. Uh, mm. It's, it's the same. It's My the family was raised Catholic, and they all had hyper charismatic. But they had a big charismatic movement in the Catholic Church. Yeah. I knew that, yes, that there was at and one point. So it was easy to make that transition from Catholicism to whatever charismatic brand of charismatic church. That's right. But but I knew I had a lot of personal friends. Like we prayed this morning for Joe Ortega's church, Sovereign Grace Church in San Antonio, and those people are converted Hispanics that came out of Catholicism that and is, came. That is something that I've seen. Yes, and they came out of that, and they will tell you, yes, most definitely, there is much difference between Catholicism than there is Christianity. Uh, 
So, related to the endowment is, is, is the, all the patron saints of Philip Black and Endowment. Right. And, but, but Paul says in, to saints of Corinth, wait a minute, they were a bunch of messed up people at Corinth, but they were, they were believers. But he called them saints. Right. They were saints. That's right. I guess they're voted on by the. I'm not, is yeah. it the school of cardinals that does that? I uh, believe. Yeah, and, and they have to perform three miracles while dead. <laughs> they have to perform three miracles but while that's, dead. But isn't that kind of new, like 200 years ago? Before that, yeah. there was different rules, and before that, of course, it was a different book. Different. Well, and of course, if you you know if you weren't if you weren't here last week, we talked about that they hold to the infallibility of the Pope, but the popes, if you look down through time, would contradict each other. <laughs> So, how, yeah, how can, how can you be infallible if the next pope comes along and overrides what you just passed, whatever? Especially that one time when they had like three of them. Was... And there were three at the same time one time. Yeah, they all excommunicated each other, and then all three of them got excommunicated, and they replaced those three with one. So. Right. 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 But again, what Mark was saying a while ago is that the Pope trumps the Scripture. So whatever the Scripture says that Christ says is trumped by whatever the Pope says this week. <laughs> That's a fixation on traditionalism. Yeah. The tradition of the church. And what, it's not just the Bible, so that they have to they trump it with that. There, I have kind of an illustration of this, um, and this is not a joke. It's going to sound like a joke, but it's not that kind of joke. Um, <laughs> I, I bought a plenary indulgence one uh, from a thrift store. <laughs> um, it a lot. It could have been written in pencil, but. It's just an illustration because literally I found this thing and I saw it and I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> it's literally an indulgence with someone's name written on there and the name had faded. This is now sitting in a thrift store somewhere. Who knows where the person was from? But here's the name sitting on this piece of paper fading. And at some point they had a belief in that piece of paper. Yeah. Mm. And here it is. Mm. And they shot and now died. Yeah, and yeah. they're gone and the name is fitting off this little piece of paper. Mm. Like, like I said last week, also my, my aunt still prays to my dead grandfather. Like that's a that's a belief in the Catholic Church that they pray to their dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The candles that they burn and that kind of a thing. I mean, anything, dude, like this should make us like really think for God, because you know you know Vita too. He's a mentor of mine. I don't know, but really strong Christian brother came from. He was he committed crimes in prison and he was. Catholic and he's charismatic, but he's a good, solid reform brother now. But he tells me all the time, you know, uh, you should thank God that you're in a reformed church because some people don't just end up, you know, speaking in tongues in a charismatic church. It starts with a little false doctrine, things like that. And I think when you highlighted the pray for brothers and sisters like that, it's, such, it's important because we really don't understand how sinful we are. And then, you know, mm. and the grace that God has given us. Until you see a brother so deep into false teaching, you're like, God, I'm thankful that that's not me. Right, right. And it's interesting this morning after I was teaching about, you know, being pretty dogmatic in our preaching and teaching, uh, I was having a conversation with Isaac. He says, you know, understand from the Scriptures when Paul is telling Timothy to be bold in his assertions about biblical truth against false teachers and that thing, is there a difference between how we how it's proclaimed from the pulpit, but then as we as the followers of Christ, ordinary people, how we speak to others. And I think we do need to remember to have grace in regards to these people. Uh, you can't go and start, you know, beating them over the head with their Bible of the Bible and tell them, "Well, you're going to hell if you continue if you believe the first rattle out of the box." Uh, with all due respect, this is a problem I have somewhat with. Door-to-door evangelism is a cold, 
conversation with somebody and you're immediately telling them that they need, you know, do you know you're going to hell or something of that assertion. You need to be able to establish, I believe, relationships and friendships with people and then be able to tell them about Christ. But that takes a little time, you know, and investing time. And unfortunately, many people in this day and age, they don't want to invest the time in order to be a witness for Christ to a person on a personal level, you know. Uh, kind of a thing, but we do need to thank the Lord that you know He's put us in uh, a church uh, that believes the Bible is the Word of God, and that we don't hold to tradition and these things because it's only by the grace of God that we're not there. Okay, we need to realize that we should have, you know, w- let me say this: Reformed people should have no pride. If we really understand the sovereignty of God, we should have zero. <laughs> pride and look down our noses at other people uh, in Catholicism or in the charismatic movement or any of those kind of things. We, we, are, we, we are what we are and where we are by God's grace is really where we ought to be. How you say our brothers and sisters who don't have a lot to be in? That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay, well, I said I was going to get to purgatory. Uh, excuse me. That, sound, that sounds bad, doesn't it? <laughs> to the doctrine of purgatory. <laughs> This afternoon. <laughs> so we'll, we'll touch on that this afternoon. Uh, okay, so purgatory. Where did the doctrine of purgatory come from? Uh, obviously, again, it did not come from the Scriptures, uh, but they do insist that there exists an intermediate state called purgatory where Christians go who are not good enough to go to heaven nor bad enough to go to hell. Okay. Uh, any person dying with mortal sin goes directly to hell after death. Venial sin, though, can be eliminated through the tortures of purgatory. Okay. Uh, you know, and so this is, you know, Christ in his earthly ministry uh, never taught this. Uh, basically, we should see there's, there's not a difference between venial and mortal sins, that all sins are mortal. All sin is, well, how many sins does it take to send you to hell? Just one. Uh, because you're not per- you're not perfect, and you got to be perfect. But uh, but Christ forgives all sins of those who trust in Him. Uh, the thief on the cross is a perfect example. You know, today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, at that particular point in time, he can receive complete forgiveness. And when we receive forgiveness of sins, when we place our hope and our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and for forgiveness of sins, it's all of them for all time. It's not that. We're going to die and still have to somehow work it off or pay it off, uh, you know. So there, there's where there's no biblical basis uh, for this. Uh, the doctrine of purgatory uh, basically came along a long time after the death of the apostles. Uh, the the word is nowhere in the Bible. There's no biblical basis any place. Uh, I guess maybe the closest thing that they could come to, maybe the the uh, the where Jesus talks about the rich man and Lazarus, maybe where the the Lazarus looks over there and he's in torments. Uh, that would be the closest thing I guess that they could come to to cite a scripture. But there's no scripture that speaks of purgatory. Uh, and it was in it wasn't until AD 600 Pope Gregory the Great made. He was the one that basically established this doctrine of purgatory. Uh, but it really didn't become official doctrine until 1459 at the Council of Florence. And then, uh, the, and then 90 years later, the Council of Trent, uh, they uh, adopted it, confirmed this by, by cursing those who wouldn't accept the doctrine. So, no biblical basis anywhere. They just decided, uh, I don't know if they got a dream or a vision, one of these popes there's, did. There's mentions of it in the in the Apocrypha. Okay. Yeah, but it, 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 it's very subtle and they pretty much pull something out of nothing. I'm going to guess that a lot of this probably comes also from Greek mythology, that the abode of the dead uh, probably is where this, and this is another one of these times, the amalgamation of, uh, of Christian doctrine and pagan doctrine. It's 2 right. second Maccabees 12, 39 through 35. Okay. Okay. That's where okay. We get it from. Okay. All right, not the, not the scriptures, but Second yeah, Maccabees, <laughs> not the scriptures, Second Maccabees. But anyway, that's that's where I touched upon that. But I mean, you can tell people that you have discussion with that there's no biblical basis for 
uh, purgatory. Um, it is important unto men once to die, and then the judgment. Amen. You know, and then and there's no hope uh, after death. Uh, you're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. So that, theoretically, like if you could, if you could make amends for all your sins, like how long? <laughs> Eternity. Eternity. Yeah. Eternity. Yeah. Eternity. Yeah. You know, and of course, since it's eternity, then there's no end to it. Yeah. You know, so you'll be paying for those sins forever. And you're sitting within seconds of when you wake up, but you're already working, dude. You're already behind. Well, and the and the pro, and if if there, you know, there's no repentance in hell. I mean, there's no evidence that there. I mean, there's. Repentance for my condition, like the rich man and Lazarus. He was sorry he was there. Wanted some water. Yeah, yeah. Paul oh, Washer describes it this way. I'm sure a lot of us have heard this. You know, in their in their true nature, that if someone was to throw the gates of hell open, they say, "Close the gates." We would rather be here than with your God. Leave us. Mm. 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 Wow. Yeah, and and, that, and that's. That's very true, I'm sure. Yeah, they would rather, you, you, know, they would rather you, you know, the reason that people, like I said today in the message, the reason that people won't come and repent is because they don't want to. They love and enjoy their sin. And they would rather love and enjoy their sin and go to hell mm-hmm. than repent, believe, and follow Christ. And that's the sad. So that's why that we pray that God gives people a new heart. He breathes His Holy Spirit upon them because you got to change. My people shall be willing in the day of my power. And so what He does is He sends His Spirit, gives us a new heart, and changes our want to. <laughs> you know. And so you, we pray that the sinner gets his want to changed. That's what we pray for. So, any other comments, questions? Okay. Good. Good feedback this afternoon. All right, let's dismiss in prayer. Uh, Brother Josh, would you dismiss us, please?